So reading the Old Testament is one of God's given ways for us to better grasp and delight in the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Some people are reluctant to open the Bible and read the Old Testament. There are some difficult passages in there. Some of the Old Testament shows the depravity of man on it in its extremities, and it's difficult sometimes for us to be able to understand how it all connects to where we are today. But through the Old Testament, when we read the stories and teachings that are there, we learn about the character of God. We learn about the character of people. And we learn especially how people need a Savior. And this morning I want to take all of you on a journey of exploration. In the coming weeks, um, should the Lord will, I'm going to be launching a sermon series into the book of Judges. And to understand where we're going to be going over the next few weeks, the coming weeks that, are, that we're going to be focused in on this series, we need to lay a proper, I guess, context as a foundation for the setting of the book of Judges. And um, as I was praying about this, the best way, I think, for us to lay the context for what we're going to be doing in the book of Judges, speaking through the book of Judges, is to actually... Um, address a message in the last chapter of the book of Joshua leading into Judges. So this morning, my text is going to be found in the book of Joshua, chapter 24. So if you've got Bibles, you can turn there. We'll be putting the scriptures on the overhead as well for you. So through the book of Joshua, God taught many valuable lessons to the Israelites. And if we go back in time to approximately 1355 BC, there was a young man that was born into the, the Israel, Israeli tribe of Ephraim, and his name was Hosea. A young man, Hosea, became the servant of Moses. And over 40 years after the exodus of traveling through the wilderness out of Egypt, Hosea became a leader in Israel and one of Moses' right-hand men. And when it came to spy out the Israelites' land of promise, Hosea was one of the 12 spies that was sent into the land, representing the tribe of Ephraim. And upon return from this excursion, only Hosea and another man named Caleb, who represented the tribe of Judah, brought back favorable reports. The other ten spies saw the land and were afraid because the land was filled with strong fortifications and powerful, large, large powerful groups of people who possessed the land. But for his faithful service to God, Hosea was renamed Joshua by Moses. And God honored the faith of Joshua and Caleb, and they were the only ones from the original exodus out of Egypt to be permitted by God to take possession of the land of Canaan, the promised land. So Joshua led the Israelites across the Jordan River on a campaign to conquer the promised land. And through a series of miracles over the course of a number of years, the Lord gave Joshua and the Israelites miraculous victory over 31 city-states, starting with the city of Jericho. The people in the land at that time were exceedingly wicked. They had practices of worshipping idols where they threw their children onto burning hot idols to sacrifice them to their god of Baal. They committed gross immorality with their goddess of fertility, Asheroth. And the whole land was polluted, and God brought Israel in to uproot the, the wicked culture that was there and give them that land as their inheritance. So through these miracles, they came to a point where they had established a really strong foothold in the land. And now Joshua, who had led them into the land, 
He's getting old. And God, is tell, God tells him to divide the land up amongst the 12 tribes so they can go and finish the work of possessing this land. Much of the work in conquering the land at this point still needs to be done. By no means are their enemies completely vanquished. But Joshua recognizes the blessing of total victory over the promised land only comes from God as Israel wholeheartedly follows and obeys the Lord. And with this in mind, Joshua proceeds to preach a very moving sermon to the Israelites. And this is the substance of my message today in Joshua chapter 24. We'll start with verse 1. Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. See, this was Joshua's final address to the people of Israel before handing the leadership over to his successors, which would be the judges to come. Interestingly, this assembly was held at a place called Shechem. Now, maybe you don't know anything about Shechem. Most people don't. Well, Shechem was an important place. You see, Shechem was the place where God met with Abraham and made a covenant with him there. About 500 years before this assembly with Joshua and his address to these people, Abraham, who was born in Ur of the Chaldees, which is in present-day Iraq along the Euphrates River, was living with his family in a town called Haran, which was actually on a, on a tributary. It was far north of Ur of the Chaldees. Abraham's family moved north and settled in this little town called Haran and was on a tributary of the Euphrates River in present-day Turkey. And we read in Genesis chapter 12, 1 to 6. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household, and the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, and the Lord, as the Lord had told him, and Lot with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land, and the Lord appeared to Abraham, or to Abram, and said, To your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. So that's the background of Shechem. Now, Abram was called to break out from living in the pattern of idol worship of his forefather. And he was called to establish a new life and a new legacy for his future family. So Shechem was the place where God made this covenant with Abram to give his family the land of promise. He would give the land of Canaan to his future grandchildren, and through his family, he would bless the entire world. This is significant because... Well, after, after Abram passed on, it did not seem like things were going too well for Abram's family. If you remember, if you read the Old Testament stories, Abram had two sons. One, out of God's, God's perfect will, he chose to, to uh, sleep with his wife's handmaiden, and she bore a son whose name was Ishmael. And for all of you who are Aware of this, to this very day, there is conflict between the offspring of Ishmael and his other son, Isaac. Isaac is the forefather of the Jewish people, and Ishmael is the forefather of the Arab peoples. So from way back when this happened, then we see there was conflict. There was a falling out between Jacob and Esau. Jacob, who had 12 sons, was then renamed Israel. 
And most of us know the story. I, I think Pastor Jonathan spoke about Joseph two Sundays ago. How Joseph and his brothers had conflict and they wound up being settled in the land of Egypt. And after some time in Egypt, the Egyptians enslaved the Israelites. So we have Israel in slavery in Egypt for 400 years. The years in Egypt were difficult for the Israelites until finally God sent Moses to bring them out of the land of Exodus and lead the land of the Exodus and lead them to this new promised land. And they are to take possession of this land God had promised to give Abraham at Shechem. So here back at Shechem, 500 years approximately after the time of Abraham, God calls Joshua to remind the people of the circumstances that they had been called out of and what it was that the Lord had done in their lives to bring them to the place where they finally had entered and taken possession of the promised land. And he also came to present them with choices that they would have for the future. From verse 2 we read, Joshua said to all the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said, says. Long ago your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshipped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him through Canaan, throughout Canaan, and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I assigned the hill country of Seir to Esau, but Jacob and his family went down to Egypt. So Joshua reminds the people of where they come from here at Shechem. Like Abraham, many of us, let's, let's bring this down to where we are today, okay? Many of us who are here and have placed our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're living at one point in families that did not acknowledge the Lord. God brought us out of many godless circumstances where our families were in settings where we were worshiping false gods, where we had false foundations. Now we tend to think of idolatry as a sin of the past or something in Eastern mysticism. Idol worship is contained to those who maybe look at little wooden trinkets and bow to them or clutch them. Or a golden calf, or maybe a statue of some form of a God who they pray to to meet their needs. We certainly don't think we have modern day idols in Western culture. But idolatry is surprisingly modern and very prevalent in our culture. And it is an issue that we as believers in Jesus Christ need to talk about. Because when we think of idolatry as an ancient way of worshiping gods, we tend to miss the idols that are all around us in our culture today. Now, it's not confined to worshiping statues or trinkets. It's much broader than that. Here's a helpful definition. An idol is when something or someone becomes more important to us than God. That's an idol, if you want a definition. The first commandment God gave in Exodus chapter 23, the first of the Ten Commandments, is this. You shall have no other gods before me. What does this mean for us today? What does our culture value above God when you think about it? What does our culture value above God? I would say a great many things are valued in our culture above God. Would you not agree? If you look around our culture, well, before our salvation, what did our forefathers teach us to value above God? In true definition, even good things can become idols when we make them the ultimate things in our lives. Maybe some of our family idols are gods of work, gods of food, gods of sports, gods of interpersonal relationships. Materialism, gods of materialism, gods of sexuality, or even recreational gods and leisure time gods. Idols may amount to anything that soaks up all of our personal and family energies and priorities at the expense of our service 
to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's an idol. That's the definition of an idol. So God desired to save Abraham from the futility of living with, without him and to help him start a new life where he would come to experience this life of freedom from the things that formerly held his family in bondage. Everyone who has been called of God, everyone has been called to come out from some form of meaningless idolatry. Idolatry that's passed down from forefathers and culture. To go to a promised land, a place where we start over again. We start over. And this is why Abraham was considered the father of faith. And this is why not only Jews, but those who obey the one true God are considered to be the children of Abraham. Do you not know that you are as believers in Jesus Christ, are the offspring of Abraham? You're not biologically, maybe, but you are the offspring of Abraham. In Galatians 3, 6 to 9, we're told, so also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that it was those who have faith that are the children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. What this means is that when you come to Jesus Christ and you, you, you bow the knee of your heart to him, you become a child of the promise. You become a child of Abraham, not physically in the case of the Jews. And I'm not replacement theology. That's not what I'm talking about here, okay? I'm talking about the faith of Abraham. You are children of Abraham by faith. The church doesn't replace Israel. Israel will come back to the Lord before the end. But we are Gentiles, and we're grafted into the root of the patriarchs. So God, God calls Joshua to remind the Israelites that their forefather Abraham trusted the Lord, that he left his father's land and his father's idols to start a new journey of faith and blessing. <laughs> this is really interesting. Of interesting note here. Abraham bore Isaac. Through Isaac came Jacob, who was renamed Israel. For those of you who didn't know where Israel comes from, that's Jacob's new name. From Israel came Judah. And through Judah came King David. And from King David came the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world and establisher of God's new covenant. Jesus Christ, fully man and God in the flesh, fully God. Next, Joshua reminds the Israelites how he released them from slavery to Egypt. So he gives them this example of how Abraham was released from the idolatry of his father and their, their former practices. Now he talks to them about um, the Exodus. Interestingly, when you read the Old Testament scriptures, there's a lot of pictures being painted by the author they understood things more clearly through pictures that were painted, word pictures that were painted. This is the Eastern way of explaining things. So then Joshua reminds the Israelites how he released them from slavery to Egypt. And he says, then, he, then I sent Moses and Aaron and I afflicted the Egyptians by what I did there and I brought you, you out. When I brought your people out of Egypt, you came to the sea and the Egyptians pursued them with chariots and horsemen as far as the Red Sea. But, when they, but they cried out to the Lord for help. He put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea over them and covered them. You saw with your own eyes what I did to the Egyptians. Then you lived in the wilderness for a long time. I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived east of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I gave them into your hands. I destroyed them before you, and you took possession of their land. When Balak, son of Zippor, the king of Moab, prepared to fight against Israel, he sent Balaam, son of Beor, to put a curse on you, but I would not listen to Balaam. So he blessed you again and again, and I delivered you from out of his hand. 
Then you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did also the Amorites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hittites, Girgashites, Hivites, and Jebusites. I gave them into your hands. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you, also the two Amorite kings. You did not do it with your own sword and bow. So I gave you a land on which you did not toil and cities you did not build that you would live in them and eat from their vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. So Joshua reminds the Israelites that God took them out of slavery and brought them into this new land to inhabit. It was God who established them in this land of promise. It wasn't by the might of their bow or their sword, their human effort, that they were established in this land of promise. It didn't happen overnight and it wasn't easy, but it wasn't the Israelites who alone were the ones who drove out the enemies in the land. Yes, God used them to do it. He strengthened them to do it and they participated with him in it, but it was not their might or power that gave them victory. Their liberation from slavery to Egyptian uh, authority was also likewise not something they escaped from by their own hand. It was the Lord who delivered them from their enemy who had them in slavery. It was the Lord. Over every set of circumstances, God gave the people of Israel grace to overcome. They had to overcome the Amorites. They also had to overcome threats from the Moabites once they crossed the Jordan River into the Promised Land. They had to overcome all of the Canaanites and the peoples, the various ites of people that possessed that land. So now, they had established a major foothold in the land. God gave them grace to overcome 31 different cities. And now they had a foothold. They had some rest. And now it was time to reflect. Now it was the time for them to understand why they were where they were and who it was that was responsible for bringing them to where they were. It was the Lord. The Lord who had established them in the land of promise. The Lord of heaven's armies who routed their enemies on their behalf. However, at the time of Joshua's address, we must realize this. The land of promise was not fully conquered. They needed to continue trusting in the Lord to possess all of the promised lands that he had given them to possess. God called them through Joshua to continue stepping out in their faith and trusting in him. So many word pictures here. So many word pictures. And each of these word pictures has a truth for all of us who have come to faith and believe in Christ. When it comes to people in this world, there, there's several different kinds of people. See, most of the people in this world are still in bondage as slaves in Egypt. And they need to be delivered by faith in Jesus Christ, the Passover lamb. Others have trusted in Jesus and have been delivered by him from the enemy, yet they wander around in the wilderness of unbelief. Because of this, they, they are not entering their spiritual inheritance. Still others have sampled the spiritual inheritance, but they prefer to live outside of the borders of God's blessing, again, because of unbelief. Finally, some follow their Joshua and enter the promised land and claim their inheritance. Folks, there's some deep connecting truths here. This story was not just told for a good bedside reading to our children. This story represents a spiritual reality. See, the land of Canaan, ultimately, was not the physical land of Israel. The land of promise was a place that God promised those who believe in him and who serve him, where he would be their God and they would be able to find a rest and a place of sustenance in that land. 
and I know I, this goes a little bit deep, maybe a lot deep. The more I study this, the deeper it goes. It's like that with the Word of God. When you study the Word of God, the connectors go ever, less, ever deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And that's the beauty of the Word of God. The salvation message is so simple that even a small child can understand it. But the knowledge of God, the wonder of God, the connections that God brings are fathomlessly deep. And if we explore those depths, if we plumb those depths, we'll never come to the bottom of it. We'll always be learning more and more good things from God. It's beautiful. I just wanted to say that. Okay, so I said, finally some follow their Joshua and enter the promised land and claim their inheritance. Well, Pastor Clint, what are you talking about? Joshua and the Israelites and us today and uh, like lands of promise. And What are you talking about? I want you to understand something very clearly here. The name Jesus has a Latin root. The name Jesus with the Latin root is the same name in Hebrew called Yeshua. When you hear the Jewish Messianic believers say, I am serving Yeshua, they are saying they are serving Jesus. But that is not, Jesus is the Latin root. Yeshua is the Hebrew root. And guess what Yeshua is in Hebrew. Yeshua in Hebrew, if you translate it into the English language, is Yeshua, Joshua, Joshua. The name of Jesus Christ is the same name. It is Joshua, Yeshua. What the Hebrew believers understand as the Messiah of their people who we understand as the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The one who establishes the new covenant in his blood. You know what Joshua means? Now that we've got, drawn that, that, that connection, Joshua means this. God is my salvation. God is my salvation. Jehovah is salvation. God is salvation. Do you see? Salvation from life in the desert. Salvation from life under the bondage of our overlords that ruled over us before we are set free by the blood of the Passover lamb. Through Jesus Christ, by faith, we exit the land of our forefathers. By faith, we accept him as our Savior. By faith, we put our trust in the Lord. Because of the grace of God that is given to us, we are enabled to have faith to set us free. For by grace, you are saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. It is a gift of God that is given to us, to each of us. So you see then, this land known as the physical, or this, this land known as the promised land, it was tangible in, in the story of Joshua. But it is a representation of something far greater there is a spiritual parallel to this story. The true promised land is not an earthly plot of land. Crossing the Jordan, friends, this has been sung and this has been taught in certain circles and it's not right. Crossing the Jordan and entering the land is not a picture of dying and going to heaven. It's not a picture of that. It's a picture of sanctification, of coming under the authority of Jesus and coming into a land, that, a blessing that he wants us to possess, to take as we step forward in faith. Being conformed to be holy just as Jesus was holy. My friends, just as Jesus is holy because he was and is and is to come. My friends, entering the promised land is a picture of dying to self and the old life 
And the old allegiances that we had, pushing away from the slavery, pushing away from the desert, entering a land of spiritual milk and honey, of fellowship with God, a living, breathing, active relationship. This is why we say Christianity in its true form is not just a religious thing out there somewhere. It is a relationship with the living God. The promised land is that place of communion that we're brought into with the living God where he walks with us and he talks with us and he tells us that we are his own. This is the relationship that God desires to have with his people. He desires us to leave our old life away, to leave the wilderness of sin and to come into the promised land, to enter the rest of God, a state of of being. The promised land is our land of inheritance. And yes, it culminates in the end to eternal life where God will wipe every tear from our eyes. That's where the promised land ends. That's where full conquering of the land comes. When we cross over into the, into, into the next stage of this. But don't kid yourself. You are a child of God right now. The kingdom of God is at hand inside of you because you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that resonates. The eternal life that you you have right now resonates into eternity. The promised land, though, can be, we can take it here now. I'm not talking about, you know, picking and choosing what we want. No. There is a lotted inheritance that God has for each of his people. And we take we go collectively and we go individually. And we participate with God in the work of conquering that land. Who here's got it all together? You got it all together? <laughs> okay, I, I certainly don't, so I'm not raising my hand. You don't either. Why? Because the promised land that God has given you still has enemies to conquer. And you're not going to conquer those enemies on your own, by the way. See, this is a picture of the new covenant of what happens with our new Yeshua, our new Joshua, Yeshua, who leads us to conquer and to overcome in this life. So, in possessing this land, certain enemies are going to need need to be routed out of the way. Enemies who come to us in the form of this world's system of values that are anti-Christ. Our fleshly desires, which are also anti-Christ. And most certainly the devil and his demonic angels, which are anti-Christ. We struggle against a spirit of anti-Christ all around us. While in the flesh, these enemies are routed one by one as we commit our way unto the Lord. This is the process of sanctification. God desires us to grow deeper, to come closer, to to find more and more peace and rest in him as we advance in our understanding and as we yield to the Holy Spirit as he puts his finger on the little things that need to be routed in our lives. Sometimes big things. Sometimes there is Shechem's to be overcome, and sometimes there's Jericho's. While we live in the flesh, these enemies are routed one by one. And this is the process of sanctification, being conformed to the image of Christ. Like Joshua and the Israelites, it was not enough for Israel just to initially succeed in entering the land. There is work to be done. Don't get, get it wrong. The Israelites got it wrong sometimes too. They tried to do things. They tried to overcome cities in their arrogance on their own. And what happened? They got trounced. They tried to keep some of the the treasures and the idols and hide the idols under their tent. And when that happened, they they received a great blow of defeat on those places. The people had to continue to believe to secure the whole inheritance. Like Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Jacob and Joshua, they placed their faith in God as more than just a one-time act. 
Being a Christian, being a true believer isn't just saying the sinner's prayer and letting it go and, let, and living as, nor, as you normally used to live. No. When you come to Christ, it is a submission of your heart. It is a repentance, a turning away from the things that bound you and your forefathers in the past. Coming into the promised land is a place where you put aside and put away all things that are contrary, that are anti-Christ. See, Hebrews eleven thirteen to 16 recounts the actions of the patriarchs in regards to their trust in God. We read, All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on the earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were looking, longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he's prepared a city for them. God's calling us to eternal glory with him. And in the process, he calls us to live and to possess this promised land that he's given us. Our faith is not just a one-time act. We must persevere daily in trusting in Jesus to live triumphantly in the land that we are called to possess. Huh. As God's people, we must see how much victory we lose out on when we falter and we look away from God and we look to the idols that bound our fathers in the past or we look to the idols of the land that were present there before we took possession of it. So, we're called by God to commit our ways to Him at a Shechem. This might be a spiritual Shechem for you. Remember the time God called you out of darkness to where He called you into His glorious light? Many things have happened in the land of promise that He's given you. Maybe you haven't entered into the land of promise because you've never given your heart to Christ because you're still bound in Egypt. Maybe you're wandering around in the wilderness of sin and you've never taken a step of faith to trust the Lord and push away from that desert and step into the land of promise. This is a time where you can reflect and recommit your ways unto the Lord. In closing, with all of this in mind, okay, I'm just going to read to you the scripture. Now that you have the context for the spiritual application to this story, as I read the rest of this story, think about the spiritual context for you and your family where you are at right now. Starting from verse 14 to verse 28. Now, Joshua says this, Now, fear of the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was, our, it was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Joshua said to the people, You are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins if you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods. He will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. 
Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve our God and obey him. On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people. And there at Shechem, he reaffirmed for them the decrees and the laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a large stone and set it up under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are untrue to your God. Then Joshua dismissed the people, each to their own inheritance. So, in pondering this, the human heart, this, this whole story shows us how in the old covenant, the human heart is not strong enough to overcome and to keep the commitments that we make to serve the Lord our God. This is why the Lord wanted to establish a new covenant. See, this was the Joshua of the old covenant. The Joshua of the new covenant, our Lord Jesus Christ, gives us overcoming power. It's not just about your willpower to throw away the gods of your forefathers and the gods that are present in the land at present. It's not going to be you that's able to do that alone. The Lord has given provision so that you no, no longer are walking with God on the outside and where you have to continually go to a temple on the outside. You have the presence of God within you. If you are a believer, the Lord has filled your heart with His Spirit. He's cleansed you by the blood that He shed. He's made a place that's holy for Him to dwell in. Now you have been given the overcoming power of God. Therefore, sin shall not be your master, for you are not under law, but under grace. Folks, we need to get this. In the end, these people made a covenant before Joshua. They recognized the fact that they had been given over to certain things that were wrong. And we're going to talk about this in the Judges, as we go into the Judges, on how human effort alone is not sufficient to keep us on track. We need Jesus. We need the new covenant um, in his blood and the spirit of the living God to give us strength to overcome. So this morning, as believers in the new covenant, Yeshua, we have entered into a land of promise, which God had given to Abraham as an inheritance. We've been given victories over our enemies to come to where we are. We must continue to follow the leadership of Yeshua. We are gathered here in this assembly today as a kind of Shechem here. The place of promise where our forefathers of faith came to when he left the futility, when they left the futility of life passed on by their forefathers. Life in this realm, the life that you live in this fleshly realm is going to have challenges. God said, you're going to have trials. This is the promised land that you're living in. And yes, one day you're going, to, you're going to have complete victory over all the enemies, but in the meantime, you're going to have to depend upon the Lord to be your strength, to be your guide, to give you overcoming power. The world, the flesh, and the devil still have pockets of resistance in our lands, and they need to be routed. What are the pockets of resistance in your life? What are the unyielded grounds in your land this morning. You can't rout it by yourself. You're not going to rout the enemies on your own. They're too powerful for you. The world, the flesh, and the devil are more powerful than your flesh. But overcoming power has been given to the saint. And that is what you are if you've come to place your life in Christ because you are not your own. You're purchased with a price, the precious blood of Jesus and the Holy Spirit has made you a child of God. You wear the white robes of righteousness not because of your own work but because of Jesus. 
And that enables you to be a conqueror, more than a conqueror. So this morning, is there anything that we're dabbling in that needs to be torn down, that needs to be brought out and left behind? Are we willing, like the Israelites said here, we're willing to accept Jesus as our, as our Savior and as our Lord to lead us We're willing to throw away the idols. What are the present day idols? Most of us here probably don't have a Buddha statue in our house. And if you do, we have issues. Right? But we also have issues if we don't recognize the fact that modern day idols are different maybe than a statue made of jade. But nonetheless, they are false gods. They are false foundations. Will we commit this morning to serving God wholeheartedly? And if we do, will we recognize that under the new covenant, we can't do this alone and the Holy Spirit who fills us can give us the strength to be overcomers and to be sanctified and be holy even as he is holy. Amen? Let us pray. Jesus, we come to you and we thank you that you give us overcoming power. We thank you, Lord, that you are God, our Savior. Your very name, Jesus, is Jehovah, is salvation. Lord, we thank you for your salvation and we thank you for the promised land that you've called us to. Lord, would you strengthen us? Would you help us to be alert collectively as we go to our separate inheritances? Would you help us to route anything that doesn't belong in the land so that it can be at rest and dedicated to you? Lord, I pray for those who are here this morning that are conflicted. They're conflicted maybe because of unsurrendered ground. God, I pray that this morning they would lay that down that you would give them new life, a new lease on life. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for the grace by which we stand. We need your help, Lord. We need your help to continue to grow, continue to see our lives consecrated so that we become, like the name suggests, like Christians, Christ-like ones, true Christians in every respect pray in Jesus' name that you would give us this insight and the grace to walk forward in obedience to you. In Jesus' name, amen.